me. In my Father's house there are many dwelling places. If there were not, would I have told you that I am going to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back again and take you to myself, so that where I am, you also may be. Where I am going, you know the way. Thomas said to him, Master, we do not know where you are going. How can we know the way? Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you know me, then you will also know my Father. From now on, you do know, you, from now on, you do know him and have seen him. Philip said to him, Master, show us the Father, and that will be enough for us. Jesus said to him, Have I been with you for so long a time, and you do still do not, and and still you do not know me? Philip? What whoever has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Do you not believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? The words that I speak to you, I do not speak on my own. The Father who dwells in me is doing his works. Believe me that I am in the Father and the Father is in me, or else believe because of the works themselves. Amen, amen, I say to you, whoever believes in me will do the works that I do and will do greater ones than these because I am going to the Father and whatever you ask in my name I will do so that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask anything of me in my name, I will do it. The Gospel of the Lord. Amen, amen, I say to you, whoever believes in me will do the works that I do and will do greater ones. Perhaps uh, that is a perfect description of the humble, blessed Father Solanus Casey. Uh, I preach parish missions around the country, and I've been doing this for about three and a half years now, full time, and about... Uh, three years ago, just as I was getting started, I was preaching a parish mission at the parish of St. Joseph in Lancaster, Pennsylvania. And I had with me a relic of Father Solanus that was given to my province of Capuchin Friars uh, in Pittsburgh. So I'm a Capuchin, the same order as Father Solanus, Blessed Solanus, but I belong to a different uh, jurisdiction in the United States. So there are five jurisdictions or provinces of our order in the United States. I belong to the St. Augustine province, which is centered in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, and we cover the states of Ohio, Pennsylvania, Maryland, Washington, D.C., and we have southern Indiana uh, and Kentucky and West Virginia as well. And um, I was preaching in, as I said, Lancaster, Pennsylvania, at St. Joseph's Parish, and I had with me a relic that our province received from the Beatification Mass in Detroit in 2017, a uh, a fairly substantial uh, particle of the remains of Blessed Solanus. And uh, I was telling some of the stories, the miracle stories, of Father Solanus during the course of the mission, and I got a phone call from a young couple with uh, six children, and they were graduates of Franciscan University in Steubenville. Dad is a veterinarian, uh, homeschool mom. They're very active in their parish. Their middle daughter, 12-year-old Margaret, uh, was diagnosed with uh, terminal uh, stage four childhood leukemia, and uh, they weren't Uh, at the mission, but they heard about the talk, and they called and asked if I would go to Hershey Medical Center, where their daughter was in intensive care, and, uh, you know, offer her the sacraments and also bring the relic of Father Solanus. And so after the mission was over, I drove up to Hershey, which was about an hour away from there, 
And when I arrived at the hospital room of this young girl, the doctors greeted me with the uh, ominous uh, words that she was dying. And they said, Father, uh, she's in stage four and she's dying. They said, don't say anything to upset the parents. And so I knew it was a pretty tough room to walk into. And um, I walked up to the bedside and I greeted her parents and I gave her the anointing of the sick. And then I put the relic of Father Solanus on her forehead. And a Holy Spirit must have just come over me because I looked at her mom and I said, Father Solanus helps little girls. I said, Pray a novena to Father Solanus. And um, uh, I finished with them. And a year later, one year later, I was, this is a true story. I was in Mexico leading a pilgrim group to the shrine of Our Lady of Guadalupe. And my phone rings in my pocket. And it's the mother. And she said, Father, do you remember us? And I said, of course I do. Uh, she said, do you remember our daughter? And I said, yes. I said, what happened to her? She said, well, we prayed the novena that you told us. And that week they tested her and they found no cancer in her body. No sign of it. No sign that she'd ever had it. And um, I can't show it all to you, it's just on my cell phone, but her mom took a picture of me uh, anointing her and putting the relic on her. And so I happened to be back in that area a year later, and I stopped to see them and uh, drove over to the house. It was in the evening, and the kids were outside playing basketball. And I pulled in, and I opened up the car door. Before I even got out of the car, this young girl walks, comes up to the car door, and uh, I looked at her, and I said, Are you Margaret? And she said, Yes. And she said, Are you the priest that blessed me? I said, Yes, I am. And before I could even get out of the car, she reached down and gave me a hug, you know, in the car. And she, uh, she, took, she was confirmed that year, and she took Father Solanus as her confirmation thing, of course. And I gave her the biographies, which are down in the book room down there, if you want to get one of the official biographies, Father Solanus, which she read. And uh, uh, she read several biographies of Father Solanus, got to know all about him. And so the family uh, is uh, incredibly devoted, of course, to Father Solanus. As far as I'm concerned, they, they didn't really know me before that. And they said, Father, before this... Uh, we never knew you, but now you're our new best friend. Right? Um, and the family is still healthy. In April, her mom sent me a little uh, text message with a video of her at her school because she had all her schoolmates and friends praying for her during that time. And there was a little video of her for her second anniversary of being cancer-free. And the cancer never came back and uh, never reemerged. So... That's all I'm telling you from my own experience. I don't know what else would have impacted that child. She was dying. The stories of Father Solanus are truly stunning. Um, there was, uh, I happened to be up at the monastery, uh, this uh, friary in Detroit on Mount Elliott Street, St. Bonaventure's, the spring before the canonization ceremony. And uh, I happened to be there the week that the Archbishop came to the friary to announce to the press that Father Solanus was going to be uh, beatified in November of that year. And there was a nun there, a religious sister, retired now and out in California, and she uh, had the opportunity to tell the group her story. Uh, her father worked with Father Solanus in the soup kitchen that he helped to start there at the uh, friary uh, back in the back in the 50s and uh, she was with him then her dad and they had invited father solanus over to their home for dinner uh, and which he didn't normally do father solanus didn't normally take uh, family dinner invitations because he wasn't a full priest and often when priests were invited to homes they would be asked to do 
sacraments, which he wasn't able to do. So he was uh, he didn't take a lot of those uh, those invitations, but I, perhaps because she know he knew her father from the soup kitchen. They were during the dinner telling him about her younger sister who had an infection in a bone in the back of her ear. And they were going to take the child to St. John's Hospital in Detroit the next day. And the procedure was to cut out part of that area and use antiseptics to clean out the infection. And this is before um, antibiotics and modern uh, kinds of treatment. So they were telling the uh, Father Solanus about her and uh, he asked to see her. So she had a very high temperature, she was in a lot of pain, she was crying, and he went to the room, sister said, and he put his arthritic fingers under her little ear, and he made a, a quiet gesture of blessing, and sister said immediately her temperature began to drop. By the next day there was no sign of the infection. She never had to go to the hospital and never had any recurrence of the infection on the back of her ear. He, there was something about Father Solanus. Um, those of you who are not on the retreat uh, for us, the group that's here this weekend, could you raise your hand if you're not on the retreat? There's just a couple, maybe four, five. And then keep your hand raised if you know the B story from this building. Do you know the B story? You all know the B story. Okay, I'm not going to tell it then. <laughs> but... It's also, you know, that that story was reported by another famous individual who lived in this house at the same time as Father Solanus, and that was Father Benedict Joseph Rochelle. Um, he's the one who often repeats that story. But my, maybe one of the ones that you don't know about the bees is Gabby was telling me that she keeps the windows closed in here and in the upper chapel because there's still bees on the property you know, probably orphans from the time of Father Solanus. And uh, they tend to get into the building. Uh, so when he was here, on a particular occasion, one of these bees got into one of the stairwell, the window wells, and Father went up to pick it up with his finger and take it outside. And so uh, one of the young students came up next to him and said, Father, how do you do that? He said, put out your finger. And he put the bee on his finger and it stung him. Not everybody had the same effect on the bees. Okay. Um, it really is something uh, that in these days in our country, when uh, not just in our country, but really all over the world, uh, maybe the developing world might be a little exception in Africa and um, some parts of the southern hemisphere to practice of religion. But there's only 12% of Catholics going to Mass today in our country. When I was growing up, 80% of Catholics were at Mass every Sunday. Today, it's 12% on average, nationally. And uh, we lose 80% of our young people before the age of 21 from the practice of the faith in the United States. And for every one convert into the church today, six people leave the Catholic Church. Just the experience of being at that beatification mass and seeing these throngs of people coming to uh, celebrate the life of this humble Capuchin friar. And uh, Father Tim, who's also on the retreat with us, he was there. We didn't know each other at the time, by the way. And we were helping with the confessions before the mass. We were hundreds of priests hearing thousands of confessions for people, many of them, who hadn't been to confession in some of them decades. It was just uh, an experience of the awesome mercy of God poured out on that city. And the other thing that was poured out on that city was rain. Uh, that day, if you were there, you'll remember it was just a drenching, uh, sleeting rain. It was uh, uh, just an enormous rain. It was cold. It was November. It was freezing rain. And, you know, even an average rain will keep most people from going to, to events. And it was, the stadium was just packed to the rafters, packed to the rafters. People soaked and smiling, right? They were just uh, delighted to be there. And 
I remember I was sitting next to our former provincial of my province, uh, Father uh, Bob McCreary, and we were standing up before we sat down for the Mass. We were in the middle of the field uh, near the altar, and Father McCreary was, uh, of course, a young friar when Father Solanus was alive. And he just was standing around, you know, looking at the, this uh, complete stadium and just in awe of the ability of this man who died in 1957 to draw all these people in together to worship God. And just more than that, the, the uh, legacy of Father Solanus uh, is just constantly, daily, bringing people back to faith, back to the church. Um, and it's, it, it is what G.K. Chesterton said. He said, the, uh, it is the paradox of history that every generation is converted by the saint that most contradicts it. And that certainly is the legacy of Father Solanus. Uh, certainly a contradiction to today's world. But he lived into our modern era. And so I think he's one of the ones, he's certainly one of the ones that's going to help to bring people back to, to faith. The other Capuchin that you see up on the altar, of course, is the great figure of Pio Pietrocina. And I was at his canonization uh, in Rome, 500,000 people at that when he died in 1968, there were 100,000 people at his funeral mass. And um, a mystic once said to Padre Pio when he was alive that his spiritual program would be responsible for a third of all the souls in heaven at the end of time, to which Padre Pio famously replied, just a third? Right? He says, what do I want with a third? Right? Uh, they're humble souls. I told our group yesterday that uh, my home diocese is Youngstown, Ohio, and there's a very venerable old priest of our diocese named Monsignor Cope. And Monsignor told me when he was a young student in the seminary in Cleveland back in the 1950s that they had heard about Father Solanus. So they decided to take the short trip from Cleveland up to Detroit to meet him. And they get to the friary door on, there on Mount Elliott Street, they knock on the door, and this old Capuchin comes to the door and says, can I help you? And he said, well, they said, we'd like to meet Father Solanus. And he said, well, come on in. He'd been nothing but trouble since he got here. And it was Father Solanus. Okay. Uh, the friars up there told me one of the other stories I told last night, that a bishop on a particular occasion came to the friary there to meet him. And Father was always very patient with people that came to the porter's office. He would never rush people, so he was always late for lunch. Okay? And in the old days, the, we Capuchins, when we came into the chapel, we would get down on all fours and kiss the floor. We didn't just genuflect and sit down. We'd get on all fours, kiss the floor, and sit down in the chapel. But uh, we also did that custom in the dining room. Okay? Because uh, uh, that's where the spaghetti was. You know, I, was I, remind, I remind the German province. Right? But we would do that in the dining room. Also, we would do that when we went in to see the superior, we'd kiss the floor. But if you came late to lunch, you had to embarrass yourself by going up to the head table and kneeling there in front of everyone and asking permission to sit. So Father was always late, so as soon as he would walk in the lunchroom, he would walk directly up to the, the head table where the superior was sitting, and the, this bishop that had come to see Father at the friary was sitting next to the provincial. And Father kisses the floor, kneeling there on his arthritic knees, and says, Benedicite, you know, can I sit down? And uh, the provincial looks at the, the bishop and says, Your Excellency, I'd like you to meet the late Father Solanus. Um, he just, he was uh, such a transformed individual. Uh, Father Michael Crosby, who edited the book that is uh, the official biography that's, that's with us here, uh, said that by nature he was, he was Irish, so by nature a sort of fiery temper, but no one ever remembers him that way. He said he was just a totally transformed beyond nature. He, he was transformed by grace. 
And he, he was just remembered as the most patient soul there is. Uh, the, the word uh, patience in Latin is, is, comes from the Latin word patior, which literally means I suffer. Okay? And Father certainly had his measure of suffering uh, with all of his physical ailments. And, you know, he could have certainly, he had right to be um, resentful perhaps or uh, uh, with his own brothers and our superiors who had limited his ministry to uh, very simple tasks. They called him in Detroit the brother that says Mass, right? Uh, because he wasn't allowed to do the other things that a priest normally was allowed to do. And, um, but uh, he wasn't. He wasn't. He, that, uh, he, he was so full of gratitude for the, the work that God gave him, the, the simple life that God gave him, and he could see, he could see, it was obvious, the, that God was using him. Women would bring their sick and dying children from St. John's Hospital in Detroit to that friary door, and many, many of these people, and children especially, were healed right in front of Father Solano. He knew that God was using him, and so his, his continued conviction of pouring himself out in that uh, trusting way on God's plan, he never looked back. You know, he was the image of what our Lord talked about in the Gospel, of never letting your hand to the plow and looking back. He just went forward. Every day was a new adventure. And even though he wasn't allowed to preach formal sermons, uh, he was Irish, I told the group yesterday, and so he had the gift of gab. And he did talk in church. Okay, And uh, most famously, he would give these uh, little spiritual talks, pious exhortations, we called them fervorinos. There was a distinction between formal sermons in those days and these little pious you know, exhortations on the saints or the spiritual life or something, which he was a marvel at giving. They, every Wednesday, even now at the monastery there in Detroit, there is a service for the sick, and the friars will bring out the relic of the true cross, and in those days they would kneel at the communion rail, he'd go along with the, the surplus and the red stole, and bless the people with the relic of the true cross. Many miracles also happened in those events. But he would, on those Wednesdays, he would give these talks, and the chapel, which wasn't large, would be packed to capacity, people standing in the chapel to hear Father Solanus. And in fact, one of the uh, famous uh, uh, professors of uh, preaching from Sacred Heart Major Seminary in Detroit had heard that reputation, was curious about him, uh, his, what he had to say. He was drawing people from all over. And he went down there to hear him. And he said, he just says the simplest things over and over again. Love Jesus. Love Mary. Pray the rosary. Go to confession, go to mass, you know. And the, uh, this professor said, you know, they're so simple, right? Right, very simple. But they were listening to a saint, and they knew it. Uh, he just exuded the presence of God. Uh, there was there was a sense about Father Solanus of uh, re resignation and peace. Uh, he brought that gift to so many people who were longing for it, and. Now, the uh, story of his uh, becoming the porter, of course, was also kind of a humiliation for him, too, because when he was ordained in 1904, he was first assigned to the Sacred Heart Parish in Yonkers, New York. And when he arrived there, they didn't know what to do with him because he is a priest and not allowed to preach, not allowed to hear confessions. So they didn't know what course to assign him to. And the story goes that the guardian, the superior, uh, said, you will, you will, he didn't even know what he was going to tell him. And the doorbell rang. Answer the door. And Father, of course, did that for the next 50-some years. And he had such faith and confidence in the Mass. That's when these spiritual favors started to happen. But one of the jobs of the porter was to register people when they would come in to have masses said by the friars or masses said by the friars in the foreign missions, the Seraphic Mass Association, most notably. 
and Father would register the people for these masses. And when people would come in with, with their distress or their illness or their, uh, their needs, he would say, I'll say a mass for you, or I'll have a mass said for you. And when he would write the names in the ledger, that's when these things started to happen. He had such confidence in the Eucharist. You know, not long ago, there was a perhaps now infamous uh, Pew Research study done of Catholics in the United States related to uh, the Eucharist. And they asked Catholics if this was really Jesus, the body, blood, soul, and divinity of Jesus Christ. They believed in, in transubstantiation. You know, and 70%, 7 out of 10 Catholics, did not identify that teaching or didn't believe it. Right? That, the, that the Eucharist was really Jesus, 70%. That's a shocking number. I think in a day when there is, um, the catechesis is an issue for sure, but that's not the whole, that's not the whole issue. I think that we have lost a sense of reverence for what that is and how it's celebrated. And that's also caused a lot of deterioration in Eucharistic faith. Uh, Pope Benedict said that uh, in, in a number of places. There was no one more convinced of the truth of the Holy Eucharist than Father Solanus Casey. It, it was even though it was all he could do as a priest, he did it with every fiber of his being. When he held the host at the consecration, like Padre Pio, he was profoundly aware of what was in his hands. And his simplicity, his innocence, his uh, Franciscan joy, his conviction about the seriousness of our relationship with God, and his also conviction that we not take ourselves very seriously is the perfect balance of the spiritual life. You know, some people, when they hear preachers today, are, they, as I, preaching is my job, and you'll hear people say some things like occasionally, Father, give us that fire and brimstone. You know, we don't hear any fiery homilies about sin and damnation and hell anymore. Give us, the, give us the real stuff, right? And then on the other hand, you have a whole group of Catholics who say, Father, we want to hear about the love of God. You know, we're t every time we come in, we feel like we get beat up. We just, want to, we just want to hear that Jesus loves us and go home, right? And, or that God loves us like we are, right? You have these two extremes. And uh, when I was a novice, we were taught a very famous axiom in Latin, in medio stat virtus, virtue stands in the middle, right? That does not mean to violate our Lord's prohibition about being lukewarm. Uh, no, it means to avoid the temptation toward our own impulses, toward extremes. The reality is that Jesus is both. He, 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 there are challenging sayings and there are consoling sayings in, in Jesus. And if you don't have them both, you don't know who Jesus is. You have a piece of him. You have a part of him. You don't have the whole Jesus. He's both, uh, he, as it, it says, he came to console the afflicted and to afflict the comfortable. Right? And uh, so we have to be able to understand him as he is. And but, but what does that look like? What does that spiritual balance look like? The saints. Deep conviction about reverence for God, love of God, deep conviction about the truth of faith, and the importance of conforming ourselves to it. You know, not conforming it to us. That's the, that's the uh, error of the world that we live in at the moment. You know, that... Uh, as I said to our group, there's only one fundamental difference <clears throat> between God and us. He doesn't get confused thinking that he's us. Right? That is the, the sin of the age. Is there a remedy for that in a positive way, in a hopeful way, in a serious, dedicated way? Look to the saints. 
They have that balance. They have that perfect balance, being, being understanding about the, who Jesus is because they knew the whole Jesus. Right? They, they had it in balance and in perspective. And they give us living witnesses to what it's like to be mature in the spiritual life, to be spiritually mature. I think Chesterton was right on about his insights, that it's these heroic, noble souls who are real people, who laughed, who ate, who, who, who worked, who suffered physically and in every other way. You know, Padre Pio, if you get a copy of his biography, one of the things you might find interesting is he had, you know, he was one of five kids. He had an older brother, Mike, and three sisters. And probably the most famous priest of the 20th century. Certainly one of the most popular saints around the world today. And they were all raised in the same house. I mean, raised on their knees, praying the rosary every day as a family, went to Mass every day. Their whole family life revolved around the church. He and his brothers served for Mass, local parishes. His uncle was the priest, right? Uh, when they grew up, one of his sisters left the church and never talked to him, never spoke to him. He had another sister, Pellegrina, who he took, he, Padre Pio took her to the, the Brigentine convent. She entered religious life, and there was a scandal in the, in the uh, convent. Not her, but she was scandalized over it. She left the order, and she never spoke to him again, that we know of. And not anything that he did. One of the most, one of the greatest priests of the 20th century who brought so much healing to people in the confessional and their families, and he had two sisters who wouldn't speak to him. There, there's all kinds of suffering. And the, when the saints show us the way, they, sh they don't show us an abstract picture. The reason why I think Chesterton's insight was so good about them is that they show us a real picture of what it means to be really holy in real life circumstances. We can, we can come to know Jesus better because they're so conformed to him and they give us living witness and example in our own day. What an amazing gift. What an amazing gift. Let alone all of the phenomena, mystical phenomena around the saints. Just the practicality of being able to know them, to have walked with them, to been touched by them, and that in an age where it is so struggling with self-destructive behaviors because we have grown in this deception about God, uh, that we're Him. <laughs> you know, Dr. Ralph Martin uh, was telling our group uh, at the beginning of our retreat, he wrote a book, um, published a book not long ago called A Church in Crisis, Pathways Forward. Uh, he's a professor of uh, the uh, theology at Sacred Heart Major Seminary in Detroit. And um, he said, you know, the sin of our age is that uh, if you live through life, if you survive life, it's hard enough, you get the golden ticket. right? It doesn't matter which religious group you belong to or don't belong to, or it doesn't matter what you do or say. If you're a good person, you die you get the golden ticket, right? And it is a sin of our age. It's a, it's a heresy. It's called universalism. I recommend Dr. Martin's book. He goes into more details about it. But I, his subtitle, Pathways Forward, is very interesting because he does end hopeful at the end of the book. And what, is he, what he says there is this, that the uh, pathway forward is not going to be us going to the Himalayas and climbing a mountaintop and meeting a guru who's going to give us some information that we don't already know. The solution to all of our ails as individuals and as a culture is already in front of us. It's in divine revelation. It's in the Holy Scriptures. It's in the, in the sacred sacraments of the church. Uh, it's in prayer that we, through which we get actual graces. What we need is to reinvigorate our enthusiasm for what's right in front of us. How do you do that? Father Solanus. 
when we are scandalized by sinners and you look to the saints, they show us what the measure of the gospel, they show us what Catholic life really is. They show us what the church really is. They show us what the power of the gospel, what the power of the sacraments can really be. And they're always there for us. The devil will always tempt people to despair and to darkness. That's certainly his game. Don't give in to it. It's not worth it. He doesn't care about you. He wants you in hell. Right? Hold on to the hope that you see in the saints who suffered, who loved, who were real people, who lived this faith in their own difficult times. Every time was difficult in some way. But this beautiful life that they, they, they showed us, uh, that the world is beautiful but passing. Not to get too stuck on it. That's the balance. That's the balanced life. To know Jesus fully of who He is and to benefit fully from His grace is to be rooted in the, the church which uh, they loved. And I, I would be remiss if I didn't end by saying, in relation to Father Solanus, that um, he uh, loved the Blessed Mother. Whenever people asked Father Solanus for spiritual advice, it was one thing. He said, read the mystical city of God. 16th century, venerable Mary of Agreda. Uh, it's a four-volume set of beautiful uh, re mystical reflections on the life of the Blessed Mother. Gone through them myself. They're, it's a marvelous meditation. I can see why he loved them, and he recommended them to everybody. So I'm sure that he would want me to say that. The uh, when he was dying, and the little card that I gave you, and I'll explain that. The little card that I gave you, and uh, uh, this other one, this larger one. At the top of it, you'll see a little uh, prayer that I just put together based on Father Solanus' last words that you know so well uh, that, he, that he recited when he was dying in Detroit in July uh, of 1957. Actually, the very hour and day of his first Mass. He died that hour. Um, and the, the, the last words are his, I give my soul to Jesus Christ. But uh, just sort of meditating on Father's words, I just sort of came up with this little aspiratory prayer. And uh, you can repeat this after me. I give my mind to Jesus Christ. I give my heart to Jesus Christ. I give my body to Jesus Christ. I give my soul to Jesus Christ. And you can do that on uh, all uh, on the rosary if you take it, uh, and you it seems to work out perfectly. Every four beads you can do as a kind of a chaplet, or just pray it as a spiritual aspiration when you're feeling tempted or in despair or whatever dark feelings might come. And you can see some other little prayers that you might be able to use. On the little card is another kind of version of that aspiratory prayer that you have with a picture of Jesus on it. And uh, Madeline, uh, uh, they produce those over at the Confraternity Gift Shop over in Fort Wayne. It's been a joy to be with you. And could we end with a prayer? Let's take Father Solanus' lead. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women. Blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. God bless you all. Those of you who are staying with the confraternity, I'm going to just go right into the next talk for the conference.